One of the questions that came up in the session on Abacavir was the fact that when DAD, um, the very large cohort or group of cohorts of over 30,000 people that have, that have been following people for a total when you combine time and the number of patients for 200,000 years of, uh, of follow-up, found not only that Abacavir was associated with an increased rate of, of, of cardiac events, that is myocardial infarctions, but so was the drug DDI or Videx. And none of the experts who were there to discuss and enlighten us could make any sense of that as to why both drugs would have the same effect since they really are very, set, very different kinds of drugs. Uh, a question from the audience also questioned why there was such an effect on heart attacks and no effect on strokes. And once again, there was no good answer for that. Um, I think what Dr. Tabas said is really true. Data is data. Uh, it is not necessarily the final word. It is not even necessarily truth. We have to try to prescribe medication or take medication with all the information that we have available. Uh, but it is perhaps a little early to give up on a drug or uh, you know, or, or change our way of practice simply because of, uh, of these data. And that would be especially true if you have a young person with very low cardiac risk because even the doubling of cardiac risk, if it is very tiny risk to start with, doubling it doesn't, doesn't mean very much. On the other hand, if you have somebody with a very high, high cardi cardiac risk, it may, be, it may be really something to consider that is changing medications. And I think the main problem is going to be that the right way to answer the question is a prospective trial, randomizing people to get Abacavir versus to get Tenofovir and follow them for a long time. But I don't think that trial is possible anymore because nobody will want to be randomized to an arm that is presumably associated with an increased toxicity. I hope there is some other large data set, maybe the BA cohort or maybe one of these national health services in a country that uh, has all, all the data in all the patients that are receiving Avacavir versus uh, Tenofovir, and we can have independent evidence uh, that this is a real effect. Because it's, it's, it would be a pity that we lose an important drug in the armamentarium to treat HIV based on data that is not that good. But uh, data is data, and th the signal is there. And I think we need to pay attention to that signal. I think we also should, should spend a little bit of time thinking back about Abacavir, which was associated or is associated with a hypersensitivity response and a hypersensitivity response that caused death in, in people. And it took good studies by immunologists to find that subgroup of patients who are, who are susceptible, the so-called genetic uh, uh, susceptibility, the, um, uh, the transplantation antigen, HLA uh, B5701, and then very quickly to develop a, a diagnostic test which should decrease the risk of, of developing the severe uh, Abacavir hypersensitivity uh, almost completely. However, the idea that Abacavir can lead to an immunologic or an inflammatory response in people genetically predisposed suggests that perhaps a myocardial infarction also could be related to some genetically limited uh, immunologic or inflammatory response. And I believe there are people looking at that right now to see if such a uh, possibility is true. And then if so, so if patients can be uh, um, identified and then excluded uh, so that a Abacavir, Abacavir treatment could be rendered safe once again. Yeah, I think um, kind of host factors, people's uh, genetic makeup, I think, is, is emerging as a larger and larger uh, factor that we need to consider in terms of uh, not just cardiovascular risk, but insulin resistance. I think all the aspects of disease that we're looking at in, in this area. Um, another big issue that, that emerged during the meeting and um, has a lot of interest from the community especially is the area of uh, bone disease, um, osteoporosis, osteopenia. And uh, what have we learned about that at, at this meeting? I mean, we, we have known for several years that osteopenia osteoporosis is extraordinarily frequent in patients with HIV infection. 
and for unknown reasons is a little bit more frequent in males than in females, which is the other way around than in the general population. And I think it's something that the HIV field has been aware of. I think the field of osteoporosis is less aware that HIV is associated with osteopenia and osteoporosis. It's a very frequent problem in our patients. I think there was a very interesting presentation from Andrew Carr uh, looking at the effects of a stopping therapy uh, on, a, on bone mineral density. It came from the SMART study, the same study that we have been discussing uh, before that randomized individuals to con complete biologic suppression versus CD4 driven therapy. And the CD4 driven therapy patients were stopping and starting therapy based on their CD4. So those patients, when they stop therapy, the bone mineral density tended to increase, which is exactly the mirror image of what happens when you start therapy. When you start therapy, a little bit independent of the regimen, maybe a little, you, uh, it's a little bit worse with tenofovir, you tend to lose bone. When uh, you stop therapy, you tend to gain bone. Uh, and I think that study is going to be an important study to try to understand the, the relationship between bone mineralization, the Im uh, immune system, and the antiretroviral medications. I think that was one of the highlights of this uh, meeting. And it was presented also during the ECAC meeting. So I think people are going to start talking about that study. Another uh, interesting uh, presentation on bone um, looked, at its, uh, looked at its effect purely in a laboratory in a, in a, in a purely scientific way. Uh, our feeling about the causes of bone disease has sort of mirrored what we've, what, what's happened with a lot of HIV lipodystrophy. We originally, um, um, thought that it was all related as a side effect of drugs uh, and ignored the, the possibility of HIV. Uh, but as we have reconsidered, the possibility that HIV may have a direct effect has come up. Certainly it is known that, that patients at the time of diagnosis of, uh, of HIV infection, uh, many already are, uh, uh, are depleted of, uh, of bone mineral. So already will have osteopenia uh, or even osteoporosis, but mostly osteopenia. It was felt that if it's not related to drug, that perhaps it's related just to an inflammatory reaction. But there was a very nice presentation from uh, a, a group in Ireland uh, that looked at the, the, the role of HIV itself in the laboratory on cells that are destined to become bone cells. It turns out that cells that are destined to become bone cells also, if appropriately stimulated, could become fat cells, and that the, the signals to those those stem cells or those, those precursor cells are really very important. Uh, and in this, uh, in this study, uh, the investigators pretty convincingly showed that HIV itself seems to, to make uh, the, those primordial cells differentiate not into bone cells, but rather into, into fat cells. And that could explain why people from the time of infection have a low, uh, uh, have a low bone density or from the time of diagnosis, excuse me, have a low bone density. Uh, with that in mind, the pediatric ACT, uh, ACTU, um, or ACTG, also looked in a cross-sectional way uh, at, at uh, bone density and at the change in bone density as children go through their maturation, the so-called Tanner stage going uh, through, uh, through puberty, and found some effects of HIV infection, I believe especially in boys. In boys, which is, it is in agreement with what we see in adults. Is more, is, osteopenia osteoporosis is more frequent among uh, males for reasons that I don't understand. And they saw exactly the same thing in children, which I thought it was quite interesting. And we don't have a very good explanation why, but uh, is, is another of these observations. That's another important study that I think is going to be commented in, in the future. Because the peak bone mineral uh, mass is acquired during uh, when you grow up, when you're, go, uh, when you're getting to your 20s. And if patients, if kids with HIV uh, have problems with bone mineralization, they are, they are going to be at much higher risk of problems when they grow up as they age than uh, if you get HIV when you are older. 